Reverend Dr. Sleston Muscura was born and raised in Rwanda. He's the founder and president of African Leadership and Reconciliation Ministries, also known as ALARM, a ministry he started in the response of the genocide in his home country of Rwanda in 1994. The mission of ALARM is to develop servant leaders in the church and community who reconcile and transform lives affected by violence and injustice. With staff all over the continent, the vision of ALARM is Africa without violent, tribal, and religious conflicts. He received a Bachelor of Theology at Kenya Highlands Evangelical University in Kenya, a Master of Divinity at the African International University, a Master of Sacred Theology at Dallas Theological Seminary, a Master of Science and Justice Administration and Leadership at the University of Texas, Dallas, and how many more degrees do you have, Celestine? <laughs> and a PhD in Theological Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. And Celestine and I had the great privilege of making that doctoral journey together. So you're bonded for life, let me tell you, when that happens. <laughs> Celestine splits his time between the alarm office in the U.S. and on-the-ground training in East and Central Africa, where he specializes in communal forgiveness, Servant Leadership and Justice Administration. Celeste is married to Bernadette, and they have four adult children, and we are thrilled to have him with us in chapel today. Would you please join me in welcoming our brother Celeste? Good morning. Uh, when I was uh, here at DTS those days, when uh, Dr. Yabo and I were suffering, people were asking me, uh, uh, we pray for enemies. And I would say, those on the list, at the bottom of the list, were my professors. They were... <laughs> um, I'm really very honored to, to be here. It, uh, it is beyond, uh, always beyond my description to have the privilege of standing, sharing the pulpit with my beloved brothers and sisters here, uh, where I have really uh, always wondered why did they accept me in this school? I think there was a mistake. <laughs> and for those of you who are coming to check, um, I pray that there will be a mistake like they did, they had one on me when they allowed me to be on this holy ground. And I have grown. Of course, I came here when I had been uh, in the ministry, uh, especially for the uh, Ministry of Reconciliation for, for two years. After I started the Ministry of Reconciliation and Forgiveness, I was asked questions that I could not answer, even though I had a Master of Divinity. Sometimes we have a Master for nothing. <laughs> or a Master of nothing, you know. Uh, you see, I had just... Uh, um, I was in my last semester at uh, the then Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology, which is today African International University, when genocide happened in Rwanda. Some of you who probably don't remember, within 100 days, one million people were killed. Between April 6 and end of July, it means 10,000 people killed every day. The tragedy was not that they were being killed, but the more tragedy was that Christians were killing each other. And uh, this, this morning I was talking to the class, the GPA. I told them most of the problems we have in Africa is not, we don't have a problem of converts. We have many converts, but we don't have disciples. So most countries in Africa, or most churches, I say our churches are full of baptized pagans. And unfortunately, I've seen the same in America. So uh, the genocide was because more people were identified with their tribe. So their tribal identity superseded their Christian identity. Because what we had been involved in was more conversion. We converted people. We did not disciple them. And therefore, they remained loyal to their tribes. And when their tribal leaders or their political leaders or their parties, whatever identity they have, when they called upon to kill their neighbors, they did not hesitate. They didn't ask what does the Bible say. And so they became tribal men, tribal women. 
So as uh, in the killings, uh, the majority of the people were murdered. About 70% of the pastors were killed or went into exile. And those who survived uh, were asking questions, literally asking me when I began going to the refugee camps in Congo and Tanzania, they would say, I know somebody who killed my wife and four children. Can I kill them and then forgive them after? That's really began my journey on how do we deal with this issue because the theology of forgiveness has been made Western approach individualistic. Now I'm dealing with a communal evil. So how do you respond to communal evil, communal injustice, with an individualistic approach to forgiveness? That's what brought me here, and uh, I'm glad to say that by God's grace, I was able to get tools, skills here that I needed to go deep, understand, but also do more research and to begin to work on our own demons. And so, by God's grace, uh, 25 years later, we continue to walk and seek to understand what God is calling us in this time, in this age, just like he called the men and the women the old. I like what uh, the scripture says about David um, in Acts 13, 36. It says, for David, after he had served his own generation, he fell asleep. And then I keep asking myself, I am called to my generation, not to the generation of the old, not to the generation next. I'm called to this generation. Like David, we are called. But this morning, I want to uh, teach you uh, about something that I have been teaching myself and the others, something that we have forgotten. So my uh, title this morning is actually uh, called uh, Your Excellency Ambassadors. What are your duties? Excellencies, ambassadors, what are our duties? I had uh, boarded a plane. They had messed up the reservation. The British Airways in Nairobi was 2004. And so I had paid. I had to come back for, for the class. So when I showed up at Nairobi, uh, Jomo Kenyatta International um, Airport, I was told I had no seat. But I had paid. I had the receipt that I had paid. And so they had sold all the seats. And lo and behold, they said, there's no seat in your class. Yes, you have paid. Now we will have to put you in the first class. I had never been in the first class. I was, I'm always in the last class. <laughs> and so as we sat, I went up. I even didn't know how to go. I, where's the, my seat? I can't find my seat because my seat was on the deck. And so they have to take me by hand and take me up. And there were only four, uh, about five of us. And uh, I knew two of them because one was the Minister of Interior, uh, Internal Affairs, Saitoti, that time. And uh, another was the Ambassador of uh, uh, America to Kenya. So I knew both. And then uh, two other gentlemen and uh, myself. And before long, they began to introduce themselves. And then when my time came, I said, what do I go to say? If I say I'm a pastor, they're going to take me back to the last class. <laughs> and so I, I thought theologically, that's what they teach you here. And then I say, I'm Ambassador Celestine Musekura. <laughs> and uh, uh, then uh, the ambassador for uh, the... the Ambassador to the, um, of the U.S. to Kenya, he looked at me, and I had said, I'm going to the U.S. He was wondering if I am taking over, if I am the new ambassador. <laughs> so, so I told uh, them, cool down, my kingdom does not end. And my ambass ambassador role does not end. I am ambassador at large. They come to ask which country. And so I was forced to tell them the kingdom of God. <laughs> Nobody talked to me after that. Of course, except the hostess and the kept serving beer and wine and all those things. And um, I took my water because and my Coca-Cola. But at the end, when we landed, uh, the American ambassador came and said, 
hey, are you continuing? I say, yes. He said, you come with me to the uh, VIP lounge. And he took me, he told me his grandfather was a preacher. And so he said I was a brave ambassador. So fellow ambassadors, <laughs> what is your duties? Now, we don't have enough time, but I want to uh, remind you, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. I will not go through the whole process. But uh, a couple of reminders. If you were to ask Paul what was the great commission, Paul will probably not take you to Matthew. He will tell you this is Matthew expanded. Because he will come back, he begins to say, then if you have made disciples, if you have gone to all the nations, what you have made people is you have made people who were old, now in Christ, they are new creation. So Paul will expand from uh, the Great Commission to actually more uh, giving us the process how we got reconciled. And we got reconciled because God suspended his punishment. Reconciliation was possible because the Bible says God stopped counting many sins against them. Because the killing in my country is because we have been counting the sins of each other for ages. That's what tribalism, that's what racism does. We always rehearse the sins of our forefathers. We always rehearse the sins of our spouses, of our uncles and our aunties, our fathers and our mothers. We never forgive them because we are creatures of justice. And justice, we call justice, that's what we call revenge. And so we ambassadors, we need to remember before we get to the uh, ambassador role that really we are ambassadors of this message. And Paul says we have been given the message and the ministry of reconciliation. After I explain that ministry of reconciliation requires that we teach people to suspend, to not count the sins, to stop anger and bitterness, to begin to relate. And Jesus will tell the disciples when they are in prayer and they remember their brother, their sister has something against them. And Mark says, you remember you have something against your brother. Either way, actually, you don't escape. You don't offer the offering. You don't even pray. So for Jesus... Reconciliation is more important than worship. And we should be going out if we have not been reconciled. Many times our church are full of people who are angry and bitter against their spouse, their, their brother, their sisters, and they are there worshiping, offering God's sacrifice, and God is putting hands in his ears. And he says, I will not listen to you. He says, go, be reconciled, then come back. This is why we have all troubles in our homes, in our families, in our nations, in our schools, in our churches. It's because we have put worship before reconciliation. And Jesus said, no, you go reconcile, then come back worship. So after Paul shows this message and this reconciliation, he said, you are there for Christ's ambassadors. So that's why in my business card now these days, I'm going to be putting first, before I put president, CEO of anything, or PhD, permanent head damage. <laughs> I'm going to begin by putting ambassador at large. Ambassador at large, because that's who we are. So my fellow ambassadors, what is your duties? Now time is gone. I have no time to tell you. I have to end here and then tell you next time. But one of the things that the ambassadors do, actually, I, will, I have more things. I was actually teaching at Duke Divinity School uh, last week, and this is some of the things that I taught. I will just mention the list, and then I will only uh, talk about one. The ambassador is trusted. The ambassador is approved. The ambassador is appointed. The ambassador represents a higher authority. The ambassador lives in but is not of the country. The ambassador actively pursues relationships. The ambassador serves first the interests of the kingdom. And finally, the ambassador protects the citizens of his country. Now, which means, the last one, we protect each other. But somebody has said, Christians is the only army that shoot their own wounded. In... 2015, there was a coup in Bujumbura. I was in Bujumbura training pastors. I had taken a man, a pastor from Nairobi, George Shramba, who was then the pastor of Nairobi Baptist Church. And when the coup happened in Burundi, they suspended all the flights 
and uh, the embassy of uh, America had to call all Americans in Burundi that they are going to be evacuated. And they called my hotel. I told them I am with George Shramba. Will they evacuate him? They said, you know, we are only evacuating Americans and Canadians. To cut the long story short, I tell them, no, I will not accept to leave him behind. If we are going to be killed, I have to stay with him. And uh, they left me. On that last flight was Sunday. My colleagues in the office, they took me for, by car from uh, uh, Bujumbura to Kanyaru on the border of Rwanda. Then our staff from Kigali, they picked me from Kanyaru uh, to the airport. By the time I did the airport, those who had been evacuated, they were still waiting. They were still waiting the plane from Nairobi to come to pick them. And when I got there, the ambassador of America to Rwanda was already at the airport because he had gone to welcome those um, who had been stranded, who were sent by the ambassador of U.S. to Burundi, to Rwanda. I had to protect them. When he saw me say, I heard about you being left behind. I am so sorry. I told him, you must not be sorry. You must give me explanation. Because I was a citizen, I'm a citizen of America. I happen to be an American and Rwandese. I had the him to actually give an explanation. And by the way, when I came back three, uh, three weeks later, I got a letter from the State Department apologizing for being left behind when the plane had six empty seats. You see, I knew that one of the roles of ambassadors is to protect. I had to protect George so that if George was to be killed in Burundi, I'd be killed with him. But also, I remember that we have no immunity. Most of the ambassadors have immunity, by the way. Ambassador can kill someone where they are. They will not be in jail there. Ambassadors cannot be touched, except by the rebels, like they killed Stevens in Libya. But we, ambassadors of Christ, we have no immunity. In fact, suffering is part of our calling. And so I want to remind you that, Your Excellencies, ambassadors, we have no immunity because the world we live in hate Christ. And because of that, they hate us. But should you stop our duties? We are Christ ambassadors. We are pleading, we are imploring, we are uh, representing our Father's interest in this world. We thank God that he has nominated, he has appointed us. And I want to challenge each one of us to go back and ask, well, how are you doing your role? How are you doing your duties? Are we prepared? I am very grateful that through that seminar I got prepared. Not only prepared theologically, I am having to deal with literally ambassadors, literally militaries, literally police, literally armies, literally thieves, I mean, in our governments. But I go with the message of peace. I think as I speak today in Burundi, since yesterday, they are training top military officers in biblical justice, in good governance, in restorative justice. Our staff in Burundi, our staff in eight countries where we serve, the ambassadors. In Uganda, after training police, Christian police officers, changing where they lead well, they have asked our staff to work on a curriculum today being taught in the National Police Academy in Uganda. I'm leaving end of July to train a second group of members of parliament and senators in Burundi using the scriptures. We have an opportunity to say we are ambassadors at large. So when I move them, I introduce myself not as reverend, da, 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 I'm ambassador. Some say, ambassador of where? Who nominated you? I tell them my kingdom does not end. I serve the king of king. So your excellencies, remember your duties. Let's pray together. We thank you for giving us the privilege of co- being collaborators with you, Lord. You do not make a mistake to point, to choose, to, um, to send the envoys in this world. Help us to represent you well in this world that is against us and against what we stand for. In a crooked community where Tribal racial identity has superseded our Christian identity. Remind us who we are and what are our duties in our communities. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.